All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back. It is Harmless Dave here talking real music in real time for real people just like you and me. And we have a special guest today uh, in the state of Florida. This guy, you know, he's, he's one of my favorite guitar players locally. Um, I saw this band now, I think, two or three times. And each time I see him, I'm just blown away. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's Tim Fick from the Bridget Kelly Band. How's it going, Tim? It's going well. It's going. It's going good, man. It's good to see you, David. Yeah, it's good to see you. Uh, I wish it was under different circumstances, like we were hanging out in some smoky room somewhere, and you had just finished your first set, and I was. Uh, I had a nice cold adult beverage, you know, that I was enjoying, and we could talk shop in the in the bar, but unfortunately, this is what we're reduced to these days. Yeah, unfortunately, it's been a long uh, year and a half almost, it seems. I, I, I lost count of the months. Yeah. yeah, well, it's about a year since everything really got locked down and, you know, gigs were being canceled. And I know you guys, you would um, make the rounds all over the state of Florida. You also, I know, have a national audience where you guys basically what what's the furthest gig you've ever played like what's do you ever play over in another country um well years ago i played in canada but uh you know this is back in the 70s when i lived in buffalo new york we had over peace bridge and play you know places like thoreau's and toronto and and fort erie and places like that but the farthest place from florida i i'm not sure if it's either the colorado or it's the Colorado gigs we've had, but I think Rockland, Maine might be right be up there because we, we went to Rockland, played Paul Benjamin's club up there, and he runs a North Atlantic Blues Festival, and uh, we did several shows up there, actually, and that was, I know that's one of the farthest blues markers that's out there on the Blues Trail, Mississippi Blues Trail, and Paul Benjamin was so so nice, he, he brings us into the Bradington Blues Festival once in a while, and he was so nice to book us in one of the clubs that he uh, uh, was you know doing uh, whatever blues shows at that club is closed down subsequently, which is unfortunate. But Paul's looking at alternative venues. But I think Rockland, Maine. Yeah, yeah Rockland, Maine's pretty far. Yeah, a little bit, a little, little chillier up. <laughs> you probably want to book that gig in the summer if you can do it, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's what it's about. Yeah. So Tim, you've been playing guitar for a long time. You and I had some conversations what, when did you start playing guitar who who was the influence was it more than one person how did it all start well i actually wanted to play drums but my dad said no drums and he said he'll, he'll put up with a guitar uh and he rented a folk folk guitar because i was listening at the time the people uh playing uh on records and obviously and uh, and I wanted to play like a few different types of players, but I liked B.B. King when I heard B.B. King stuff. My brother used to bring the B.B. King albums home, and I thought that was really cool. And my brother would also bring all sorts of other soul music albums home. And, you know, Jimi Hendrix later, uh, I was probably, I don't know, very young, but I started playing when I was about eight, actually, eight wow. years old, uh, banging away on a, a rented folk acoustic guitar. And it was probably because, you know, the Stones were out yeah. at that time. So I was born in the mid-50s. So right around the British invasion were all these bands coming in. And I'm like, oh, I want to learn to play like that. Then later, of course, I found out B.B. King. And I was like, oh, I want to do that. And I, I want to play like Jimi Hendrix. And my dad was taking me for lessons. Yeah. Lessons yeah. as a kid. And he could, he could just about afford that because um, we weren't a, a well-to-do family. But right. he was... He wanted, you know, me to uh, excel in the things that I really liked. It, it wasn't sports. It was more or less guitar and music, you know. Yeah. But uh, that's, I sort of wanted to play like those guitar players, like Jimmy and 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 BB and all those that I heard back in the early 60s. Later, Cream, Eric Clapton, you know, Allman Brothers, of course. That was, just blew my mind. And, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've been playing, I was playing for about 50 years, I guess now, for more than that. I've been in my mid 60s. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it, it does suck when you, when you like do the math, you know, you start doing the math and then it gets you in trouble. 
Um, I've been doing it lately. I'm not as not quite as old as you, but man, I've been doing, you know, back in I go back in 1981, and people go 81, and I go, yeah, I was going to see concerts in 81, and uh, anyway, we won't go down that road right now. Yeah, 1974 is when I played my first, you know, gig as a, as a musician. I was underage, and I played in the clubs in Buffalo. It was yeah. the first time I was actually playing live electric blues and blues rock and classic rock on stage, at, you know, as, as a musician. But my first gig actually came around, I was around 11, 12, 13, somewhere thereabouts. Uh, I had a little band that I put together and it was, it was a cable vision, local cable uh, vision company that operated this local station yeah. in the area in Lackawanna, New York. And I used to go down and watch the shows when they opened the doors up. And you could see through the glass and stuff. And sometimes they'd open the big doors up to the studio. Bands, they'd bring bands in. And I told the lady, I said, I have a, a little band. It was me, a, a drummer, and a, and a singer. So it was like the White Stripes with a singer. And uh, we did a CCR song. And I did my first original blues song. So that was fun. Yeah. I mean, so you were writing songs at a young age. Yeah, they weren't very good. <laughs> But you're writing them. That's that's the key. I mean, I've, I've been hearing a lot of these guys who talk about songwriting. They always say, you know, keep writing the songs. Eventually, one's going to be, you know, the the big one or whatever. But I think in the blues, you know, it's it's a little different. I think songwriting, I, I, for some reason, and I, you know, I could be completely off base here, but it's almost like the music itself in a blues song can be more important than the words you're singing. I don't know if that's true or not, but I mean, obviously when you're singing blues, you know, and if it's traditional blues, you kind of know where the lyrics are probably gonna go uh, for, for a lot of it, but it's the feeling, it's kind of the emotion. And you're one of those guys puts a lot of feeling into your playing. I mean, you do a lot. Uh, I mean, you've got like a psychedelic thing that goes on um you know maybe that's the hendrix influence we're talking about um, but i think i think you're pretty unique as far as guitar players and that's one of the reasons i think i was drawn to the band's work you know it's it's funny because there is that element of the psychedelic west coast kind of you know i want to call it a california west coast psychedelia era sound because that's and that was music that was hot at the time when i was growing up but but there's also that other element i took when I was taking guitar lessons, I was learning jazz scales and jazz chords and jazz comping and all that stuff. And and I didn't really like jazz. I, I, I found it to, to be very, you know, a music you could really express yourself with. And, and that's where you're going with that. Sometimes it's just about the music because that's what jazz is all about is the twists and turns of the songs and all that. But I, I try to infuse some of that with pentatonic scales, take the jazz scales, take the pentatonic scales, bring them together, and then try to create a hybrid sound and and I guess I borrowed from a lot of people I stole from a lot of people yeah. you know Hendrix P.B. King I want to say uh Buddy Guy you know the way he bends notes and the way he just rips into strings and stuff I really love I got I got off on that man and yeah. I said I gotta incorporate some of that in my playing as my buddy yeah. one of my three dogs <laughs> so yeah it's good we got another guest on the show that's good I think that's the first dog appearance yet <laughs> Wait, uh, it's probably a good thing um so you guys when did um when did the bridget kelly band start and maybe you can incorporate the tale of you know you and bridget are actually a couple you're married and you've got this band and she's the lead vocalist and you're the guitar player when it all how did that all happen that's kind of cliche, you know, the singer and the guitar player mm -hmm. and the husband and wife <laughs> there's a lot of those well the thing about it, she was a Florida folk musician yeah. before I met her, and she was singing at folk festivals and going to the Will McLean Festival, the Florida folk, whatever, all these different folk festivals. And when I met her, I was going through a divorce. She was going through a divorce. We met at a, a friend that invited both of us to a party because the friend said, you both wear cowboy boots. You both wear hats. Uh, <laughs> you both play guitar. This is this is, this is going to work. So we didn't, you know, we didn't plan that, but it was a, a six six-year-old's birthday party that my friend invited me to uh, who's that well it's a long story but she actually knew Bridget at the time and I was working at, at with a band called Dizzy Gordon and the artwork for Dizzy Gordon band there was a hat that we borrowed from my friend Nancy and Pete 
the, the couple who set us up, that hat was actually Bridget's hat. And I had it on the album. On, I didn't even know Bridget at the time. And we put out the artwork, put out the album, Dizzy Gordon. It was a Southern rock album, pretty good stuff. There's a couple of blues songs on it too. And come to think of it, that was like a, a sign that, that we were going to get together. And then we met each other and it was like, uh, we kind of hit it off. Uh, she was going out with this other guitar player at the time. <laughs> and, and me and him had a hair cutting contest in the living room of, uh, of, the, of this of this birthday party. And it's it, it was crazy. But and it was uh, probably around 2007. Yeah. And the summertime. And we started playing music a little bit together. Uh, I was we did a we did a duo thing. Um, on the phone. Sorry. We did a duo thing, and uh, I was basically a background guitar player for her singing. And uh, I convinced her. I said, "You know, you could do some blues." She goes, "No, I can't. I'm a folk singer." I said, "Yeah, you you can. Yeah. You can. You 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 understand. You've gone through some tragedy in your life. You understand." And and after that, well, there you go. We started playing together and working together, and put our first album out as. Bridget Kelly band in 2012. 2012. And I think it was 2012. Yeah. Did you did you get married before that or after that? Hello there. Hold on a second. Guess what? <laughs> Hello. David Spurrier is on. He's on the road. It's Bridget calling. Hey, Bridget. <laughs> hey. Put on. Hello. Sending his love. <laughs> <laughs> She sends love back. All right, absolutely. Um, so we do. You get maybe she called because she knew we were talking about her at that point. I don't know. It's but, weird. Um, we got a lot. There's there's so many connections. When I walked into her house for the first time, yeah, uh, there was a there was a Mickey Mouse birthday celebration poster, and it had November 18th on it, and that was um, her ex boyfriend's birthday, and that was my ex wife's birthday. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yeah. And I walk into her living room and she's she's got uh the kiss from Clemp Clemp and and she has that hanging. I said, that's what I got hanging in my living room right now. It was oh, the weirdest, weirdest thing, man. There's so many different strange occurrences. I knew this was meant to be. Yeah. And I just went with it. She went with it. And um, you know, we drive each other's nuts sometimes, but you know, we got there's a lot of love there between us. So yeah, it's like every every relationship sometimes, you know, yeah, it absolutely close. Um makes for some good on stage chemistry, you know. <laughs> yeah, and it makes for some good music. We could write some good blues tunes, you know. Right, right. Um speaking of blues and writing, we got this album as your a latest album came out at the beginning of last year, right? Dark Spaces. Yeah, yeah, it was, and it's got a it's got a few prophetic songs on here. I mean, a lot of blues albums, you know, when they talk generally speaking about being in a dark place, and um, there's one line about being in a room, a ten by ten room, on the first song, and you're like, here we are, welcome to 2020, and then and number this is still number 21, by the way, on the Florida blues album chart. So that's still shows that you guys have, um, you know, a good fan base out there and still interested in your music. Um, I've got a bunch of them. Thanks to you guys. You, you either you sent these to me or I, I'm pretty sure I, I was bugging you guys to send me all these. The first album I ever got was this uh, album by um, it's called Bone Rattler. It's like a, a two CD thing. And I, I was I was playing this thing like daily for weeks and weeks. I really just, the vibe on it was so different from what I had been listening to. And um, that's when I kind of fell in love with your band. And Bridget's got kind of a sultry voice, um, sassy, sultry, can kind of go in different places, different areas. And then your complimentary guitar where you're over there and, you know, little sparks coming out. Um, you know, what is, what is, if you were to categorize this music, like the kind of music you guys make, what would you call it? Uh, I, I think it's blues rock because uh, yeah. it has influences of blues and it has influences of, of rock and roll. Right. Uh, um, hard rock, pretty much. Um, I, I, you know, it's an amalgam. It's it's. Uh, I, once, I once used to describe my playing style and I did this 
a long time ago as conglomerate rock. It sounds kind of a, but, you know, you talk about, you know, conglomerate rocks, they're, they're composed of different things. And I, I look at sort of what I do is that, you know, it's, kind of, it's a blues rock bass, but it's, you know, I draw from jazz. I draw sometimes from uh, Latin American scales and, and you know, the different ethnic scales. I'll reach out once in a while and try something Eastern, but mostly, you know, harmonic and melodic minor scales and things of that nature and pentatonic scales and kind of, like I said, jazz scales, mash it all together and take different approaches, put a little, put a little uh, T-Bone Walker in and throw a little Albert King in and throw a little BB King in and then throw a little, I don't know, a Johnny Guitar Watson and a little Chuck Berry and then a little Johnny Winner. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is what I'm talking people, about. People used to say stuff like, oh, yeah, oh, you're trying to be Stevie Ray Vaughan because you're wearing the hat and stuff. I said, you know, I said, that's ridiculous. I love Stevie's plan. I just, I just actually watched a documentary the other day. Yeah. It's like, no, I'm not trying to be Stevie Ray Vaughan with the hat and stuff. I was wearing hats before Stevie Ray Vaughan was wearing. I was Zorro back in a, as a kid. That's what I grew up with, Zorro. I, yeah. I, I used to tell people, where, where, where does the hat come from? Wow, well, you know, I said, Zorro. And they look at me like, I'm nuts. And like, that, I mean, we used to watch those old Zorro films back in the day. Black and white, and uh, I was Zorro several years for Halloween, and it was like, you know, I'd ru be running around with my little plastic sword and my hat and my cape. I know I had a, I had the mask and stuff. So that's where that hat comes from. Yeah, <laughs> but well, but I mean, there's so many different things I borrow from. So yeah. I I guess it's just a hybrid. I can't really. Yeah, it's it's a cool it's a cool hybrid. So you know, if anyone's watching this. Uh, make sure you check out Bridget Kelly Band either on, you guys are on Spotify and uh, all your stuff I think is uploaded to YouTube. And obviously you want to, you know, you want a physical copy like old school, like me, you should go and purchase. Um, you guys have a website where you sell these? Uh, we don't sell them on a website, but people can get it through Amazon. People okay. can buy them. Can, they can download from different places. There's, there's literally you know, 30 places that you can buy copies of your favorite songs. If you want to download an M MP3, but you can still get copies from CD Baby and uh, Amazon and places like that. And iTunes, of course, it's still yeah. on iTunes. What's your favorite al uh, song on the album? I know you like Bone Rattler, but what about the new one? Um, Jeez. I, I'm kind of thinking between Dark Spaces and Free Me, probably because I've listened to the you know, when you start listen, when you listen to an album this way, you always listen to like the first few songs. I don't usually put random because I like to hear the album as you guys intended to, you know, like the old days and you flip the album over. Um, I don't do any of that random. I do it on playlists. I'll do a random playlist. But um, there there were a few. I mean, this was I mean, not to say it lived up to its name, but this was a darker album for you guys. This was. I don't know if there were a lot of personal struggles going on or, you know, I, what, who wrote most of this? Was it a combo effort between you and Bridget? It was a combo effort as usual. Yeah. I, I usually come up with some, some music and we come up with a concept and we both contribute lines or phrases or lyrics or hooks. Hmm. And then we kind of refine it, you know, what is it, where's it going? What, what do we want to say here? And how, how do we want to, uh, convey this theme concept whatever construct and 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 then we we get together I put a, usually a track down with the guitar just a rhythm track just a, as a pre-production track and we kind of iron the song out in terms of how many bars and where's the verse where's the sometimes uh, we overthink things and, and after I recorded I go oh, I wish I wouldn't have put a bridge in or I wish I would have put a bridge in but stuff like that you know it, it does it doesn't matter after the fact, but the, the ideas are there. And yeah, I, it's funny that you mentioned Dark Spaces because that's up. That is my kind of like favorite song on the album. It is, and it's a dark. It's a dark place. Yeah, uh, it's like the recesses of your mind where you go and you think too much and you go down a rabbit hole. And that's that's where we were. You know, we were going down rabbit holes. We had a lot of stuff going on. Her dad is was in hospice. You know, we had this freaking sinkhole that's across the street that's getting still growing. Uh, wow. We had COVID. Uh, we've been sheltering in place. You know, there, I had some health issues that I've been dealing with. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel I'm feeling better now. Um, Good. But there's a lot of 
there was a lot of dark things happening at the time. And, yeah. and still, still today, uh, uh, there's, there's stuff going on, but you know, we, we had to express it. We had to get it out because otherwise it was eating us alive. So that, what best way to do it is create some music. Yeah. Well, well, I think when I reviewed that album, I said, well, if, if you like the blues being the blues, you know what I mean? It wasn't like a uh, subject matter that, that wasn't expected within the format that you guys are in the genre. So, you know, I, I it sounds like you guys uh, have a lot of that kind of material. You, the prior album, which is called blues warrior kind of looks a little bit like my, sh my custom design shirt here. Um <laughs> you guys tackled some really interesting issues on this, like drug addiction was one of them. Human trafficking, I think was another one of them. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, this is, it's, it's really timely because a lot of these things that are going on in, in society now, and a lot of people are kind of, I don't want to say they're turning a blind eye to it, but maybe they just hear it and kind of goes in one ear and out the other. I, I don't know. Homelessness was one of the topics we, we, oh, yeah. we hit on. And uh, loneliness, uh, of course, but that's a you know traditional blues thing. But the homelessness thing really hit us hard. I mean, here we live in a, one of the the richest countries and richest states, at, you know, state of Florida in the world. And, and when Bridget, I remember we were in Daytona, we were doing a gig, and Bridget was crossing that big bridge at night, and there were all these people sleeping on the bridge and wrapped in tarps, and it yeah. was really it was so disturbing to us um, on, a, on so many levels. That this could be happening in you know in the United States, let alone such a place like Florida, it was horrible. And and you no, know, we have a great state, and a fantastic country. And, but we need this, you know some issues need to be taken care of. And homelessness is a big thing. You know, a lot of those guys are vets too. And, and yeah, it's, it's it's heartbreaking. You know, it's, it's, it's so you know we wrote about it. You know, what can we do? But we can bring attention to it. We can bring awareness to it. And you know. It, it was about writing a song to do that. You know, I get a little teary-eyed because it's it's an emotional subject. Because um, you know, what worst thing to, to be in a place that you're not, uh, you don't feel like you don't belong, and a place where you don't have a home. I mean, that's like that's like that's that's heartbreaking. I, it just tugs at my heartstrings. And I, yeah. Anyway, that's the kind of stuff we run into the stuff when we write songs about it, and. Uh, I, it's okay. I get. I I'd like to do a happy album. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, maybe you should just do an instrumental kind of. You know, uh, uh, maybe you should do like some surf guitar. Me, I don't know. Um, but <laughs> but I mean, then you know, the this is a blues band, and you got blues warrior in dark spaces and bone rattler, and then you get back in the blues, and then uh, forever in blues. Forgot about that one. I got. So that's yeah, one of my that. favorites. You know, if you really that song "Forever in Blues," if you listen to that, yep. I I really like what Bridget does with her vocals. She's not a screamer. She's not one of these blues singers that goes, you know, growls and the, yeah. the little subtleties in voice. And what she did, there's a couple songs on the new album, particularly. Um, I I like what she did with "Dark Spaces" with yeah. the vocals, but I also like what she, she did in the song called "Moments." very subtle stuff uh, that moment song was kind of an epic uh slow number and you know what Bridget stuff is about the little nuances you know it's it's not about blasting it out you know she's she's not going to be blasting out like an Etta James or a Coco Taylor she's yeah. she's more on this, this the softer side and you know you don't have to you know you don't have to belt stuff out to be to convey emotion is what I'm saying right right and just for the audience too, if you haven't seen this group live, which you probably haven't, you know, I've been fortunate enough to see them live. Is uh, you and Bridget are both great on stage. You're great performers. You're just um, Bridget is very animated on stage. She's got a couple of moves that she does and so forth. She just gets the audience into it. And you're up there too. Um, and typically, you guys have a great rhythm section. You know the times that I've seen you. Um, is is the live like that's obviously i mean studio recording i'm sure you guys are like okay that's fine but your bread and butter as a blues band in florida is to get out there and perform absolutely it's nice to to have an interaction with our audience and to have them liking what you're doing and you know and you give back 
you know, that emotion, outpouring of emotion. It, we've missed that, you know, tremendously. Uh, we did a show in October for the uh, Blue Society in the villages, and yeah. we had like 250 people show up. It was outside, it was an outdoor venue. Yeah. Um, so it was completely outside, outside stage, outside. And everybody was doing the social distancing stuff, but it was, it wasn't the same, but it still was great to be able to play in front of people again. We got a show coming up, you know, soon at the high dive, and I'm looking forward to playing that. And uh, just to get out again and be able to, you know, bend some notes and play guitar again. And I'm I'm almost healed, so I'm ready to I'm ready to play. Yeah. And uh, I'm still going to wait a couple more weeks, and uh, then I'll get back into it. I just got to be careful. But yeah, life is good when you're playing live, and then yeah. you know, yeah, it's uh, there's nothing like it. Yeah, I think I, I think I told you, you guys really should record one of these gigs and put it out as a live album because the energy you guys and I actually think Bridget is better live than she is on. She's good on record, but live, I think there's something her voice just seems different, seems like there's almost another dimension to it when she's performing live. And you guys plus you can do a lot of improvisation um you want to go off and do a solo and I, your solos are epic you know I, bridget when i first was talking to bridget she said enough about me you need to contact tim and she was giving me all your your info like talk to tim because you guys can talk shop he's the one to talk to about all this stuff and um she says wait and she said to me wait till you see him play live that's what she what she said to me. And I sat there, I think it was Buckingham, and I sat in the front row or whatever. And I'm sitting there just shaking my head, going, no way. I get to see this guy perform live, and I'm this close to the stage, you know? And in in my world, because when you boil everything down, the drama and all the stuff that happens with these, you know, big time name artists and so forth, my my thing is, am I there to, I mean, I could be at some grocery store and a band is performing you know upstairs or something in their loft playing live and if they're any good i'm gonna go up and listen to them you yeah. know what i'm saying and i felt like hey i got to see this guy i told a lot of people i said i got to see this guitarist who's just insane uh in a good way obviously and um you know it, it was one of the better gigs i had ever seen up up close so all i'm saying here to all the people that watch the channel is if you have the opportunity to see Bridget Kelly band, Tim Fick playing guitar. You, you should do it. You should go see it. You know, it's crazy. I, I, I remember that show that you came to in Buckingham. Yeah. And I, I do a comparison contrast to a show that we played a couple of years ago. We were on the road, Nickel uh, District uh, Blues Festival. It was outside of Indianapolis. Um, and it was uh, crazy because we were opening up for Robert Cray. It was like 5,000 people. Wow. And I got to play. I got to play his guitar in this big stage of Brian Spirit. And I'm thinking about it. You know, I put the same amount of energy in the Buckingham show as I did here yep. on live with 5,000 people. It doesn't really matter. It's live. And if you play for one person versus you play for 5,000, uh, it really, it, it, you're doing the same thing because you're, you're connecting to something that's otherworldly. Uh, that's around us, that's bigger than us. And it doesn't matter if you're doing it for one person or many people, actually, that it, I get the same high and I hopefully we translate the same amount of, uh, you know, that spiritual connection, that emotion, that vibe to others. So, you know, I appreciate the kind words of people saying stuff like that. Um, yeah. There's so many great players out there. You know, that, that I get that same feeling when I go and watch, like, you know, players just go to a concert. Jimmy Herring, I watch him play. He's amazing. John McLaughlin, when I watched that, him and Jimmy playing on a tour. Yeah. Uh, there's so many great players. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Well, in state I mean, of Florida, it's, it's like you got Albert Castiglia, Damon Fowler. I mean, yeah. and you tell people about these guitarists and they're like, who's that? I go, oh, you don't know. You got to go. You have to go check these people out. I mean, and then you know, to have the opportunity to see someone like yourself and up close and just hanging out. And then, you know, it's like you're approachable. You can talk and we can talk about music and you're not like some conceited guy that's going to like, oh, you know, you need a <laughs> you need a lanyard. You need to go backstage or whatever. And 
And um, I just appreciate that connection and the realness of it, which I think is one of my little pet peeves these days is that um, we're losing, we're losing a lot of that because the music industry is so different and there's so much, the blues scene in Florida alone in just the state of Florida. I mean, if you had a way to organize and say you had a network of blues rock radio stations in the state, I mean, you guys would all be famous by now. You'd be, <laughs> you'd, you'd be, you'd be very famous, you know? There's so many great players. You're right. Edward Castillo is a phenomenal player. Uh, J.P. Soar is another guy. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing uh, the amount of talent we have in the state of Florida. You're right. Uh, um, Damon Fowler, just, just a monster on freight train. On yeah. Playing laps, the lap steel, lap slide, and the and guitar. It's just, just these guys are. You know, they're inspirational. I've, when I go to Sam or I get to play a festival and they're there or I get to, a chance to, you know, I walk away being inspired and I, I'm always taking something, uh, you know, a little piece of them with me and going, wow, just like I took a little piece of Johnny when I listened and watched Johnny live, Johnny Winter, you know, yeah. or a little piece of this guy. And that, you take them with you and, you you know, uh, you make it part of, you don't copy it, but when you make it part of your vocabulary in some ways. And your it's life experience, and that affects everything you do after. So yeah, yeah it's cool, man. It's, it's like a great reading, place to be. It's like reading a musical guitar book before you, you know, and then you're you got more knowledge, and you put it into your next uh, next gig or whatever. So um, the obvious question: you have you said you had a gig booked. Um, do you have any other gigs booked, or do you know what's going on yet? Well, we're gonna we're gonna start uh, looking into some festivals, some of the stuff we were looking at already was canceled for even this year, 2021 already. Yeah. We had a tour scheduled uh, and we were ready to go on and embark. And uh, before COVID hit of Canada, we were gonna do a lot of shows in Canada. Yeah. And um, we were gonna head up to the Midwest and then over, uh, you know, do gigs in Minneapolis, Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois, and then head up into Canada but all that got canceled, and we tried. We started thinking about re, redoing it, but again, a lot of the festivals already canceled for 2021, and they're not going to be doing shows. And a lot of the bars, we can't get into Canada right now. I don't. I don't believe it's. It's still there's a restriction in that. And there's yeah. a lot of the clubs. A lot of them. A lot of clubs have have folded, and there's other clubs that are in danger of folding. And we're just hoping this thing can, you know, we can get through this and with minimal collateral damage so to speak but it's uh, it's just been horrible yeah yeah i mean I, we can't we can't if we get a couple of jobs we can't we need wraparound gigs right around those you know so we could you know if you get a a, a large festival uh we need to have supporting up to the festival and supporting back and all that stuff and it's hard to fill in the holes right now this some guys have been doing it uh but we'll see what happens. We were, I was checking for a while. We were waiting to see what's going on with my, my arm, but yeah. I'm going to be, I should be ready. I got a show booked in April. So I'm going to be ready for that. I know. And I'm ready for the rest of the summer, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, locally, you would think that some of these, I, I know the, I think Buckingham has had shows. They haven't had, I think mostly out they're outdoor behind the, the the bar they do that like on saturday and sunday i don't know if you know if they're they're he's taken a different approach he's kind of been more like in just do the in-house he's got an in-house band that he does a lot mm -hmm. but, um the other one in fort myers i don't even know if they're still operational i their whole schedule i used to look at their schedule just to see what was on it and that whole website just went away so i was like okay I guess they're <laughs> I guess they're not having any gigs it's it is really it's really discouraging um but you know might might be some maybe time for you guys to maybe record yet another album are you thinking about doing that yeah we did we started working on tracks before I hurt my arm yeah. uh we had actually a song almost done it just needed I needed some extra guitar work done on it uh and Bridget needs to cut the vocal and we had one in the in the hopper we were going to release it as a single yeah, and, and it was, it was something that that you know, like a spinoff of an Allman Brothers kind of southern rock blues kind of sound, yeah. and it was pretty. It was a pretty cool uh, track. And then I had a bunch of other ideas that I had put pre-production down, 
so yeah, I mean, there's, there's another album in the works. Absolutely, it's just that uh, I don't need to do any more writing for it. I just need to get like pre-production tracks, get it, get the stuff arranged, you know, get the arrangements down, and then bring in some musicians and and then cut some, you know, cut some rhythm tracks and then do the vocals overdubs later. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, we have stuff written. Cool. I, I'm I'm trying to wait till like I'm totally healed. I, it's it's you know I I can't do much right now playing, and I don't want to spend eight hours playing guitar and then that, you know aggravating my arm again. So yeah, well save it for a gig where you're gonna. Now you guys um you you do all your your like production in house right? You're you're not you're doing everything yourself, correct? Yes, indeed, because of the cost, uh, and also because well not only that it's um. Uh, it's convenient with scheduling because this way, we, uh, we if we have recording sessions, uh, it's very convenient to bring musicians in under our schedule as opposed to having to worry about a studio where they can fit you in for four hours here and then one hour here. And, yeah, you know, forget that. I, you know, we like to we like to keep things completely uh, in house so we have com we have control over that. Right. Well, I wish you the best of luck in twenty. 21 mr tim fick uh i know it you're you're one of them grinders you know you're a blue collar kind of musician um this this whole kind of thing doesn't affect some of those uh rich rock stars as much because they can they can shelter in place for the rest of their life if they want to it'll be probably fine but you know with a guy like yourself and your wife you got to get out there and and make some money to pay the bills. You know what I mean? So I wish you the best in 2021. Well, appreciate it. You know, Dave, we always, we always appreciated your friendship and your support. And um, you, you've been an advocate for our, for our, the blues and for our band. And that's been very nice. And I, I, again, I, I like to thank you for that because um, the real music observer, I mean, you, you, <laughs> you, you get it, you get it. And you appreciate it, and you know guys like uh, like us uh, who are just playing the music for other people. It's, we don't do it for our egos, because you know we we're not trying to be the biggest and the baddest. We, what we try to do is just create music for people who love music, and we we need people who appreciate music, listening audiences, live audiences, whatever. And we need people who understand and get it, and um, yeah. it makes our job easier. It makes our our art easier to create because you know you're out there and 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 it's a real love it's a real love uh we're we are we're at we're at where we're at is where we're at because of the people who listen to our music art is you know something got to be shared music's got to be shared yeah uh it's 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 important to keep to keep cranking it out but the reason we crank it out is for enjoyment and for people who you know uh, who appreciate it, and uh, and we appreciate them. More. We are so grateful for the people who say, you know, hey, I heard your music and and it touched me or it affected me or something. That song got me through COVID. You know, how many times I've heard that. It's like yeah. that song. You were. It seems like you're writing about COVID, and I'm like, kind of, but it's yeah, okay. If that worked for you, that's great, and that makes us. That makes our day. Yeah. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Yeah, well, again, I don't know. You got I'm sure you guys didn't have this pre-planned, but you know, uh going into the whole um lockdown and everything and you have this album called Dark Spaces that comes out. And like I said, you know, you're in the 10 by 10 room looking at the wall going, crap, this is where I have to stay, you know, and um so, you know, it's the blues part of it is the blues part of it, it's the writing style, it's that you guys are real life you know, and again, I appreciate real life. I appreciate, you know, the hardworking men, women who are out there who um, maybe aren't as famous as they should be. I think you're in that category. You're one of the, if you were on the top 10 list, you'd be at number two or three on my list of unheralded, you know, guitar players that people should go out and listen to, you know, and I, I do mean that. I mean, there again, Florida has a lot of great players. Yeah, um, and, you know, I've seen you got and I've seen you perform live. You've been doing this for years. You've been a road warrior. And I just, you know, I'm hoping that your arm heals up and this uh, virus, you know, vacates the premises and doesn't come back forever. And you, you and Bridget are out there on the road again, doing what you do best. 
Yeah, I, you know, this. it's funny because uh, being in my mid-60s, I was just a little concerned about the virus and all that. Uh, but, you know, it is what it is. And uh, there's reasons for everything. And I, I, I really believe that uh, the blues is about survival. It's yep. about tri triumphing over, uh, you know, the forces and factor or agents of oppression. It's about moving, about facing that adversity and getting and moving beyond. And, yep. you know, we're, we're, if you look at today's society, this whole thing, we're, we're living in a blue, blues microcosm. I mean, this, it really is. It's, it, it's crazy. You know, there's, there's adversity on so many levels, financially, economically, psychologically, cognitively. I mean, it goes on and on. And Politically. That's, about, that's what the blues is. Yeah. It's, and, and, and that's it. So you're, you're, you're at the right, you're exactly where, you know, whether you believe in God or not, that's where probably God wants you to be because, um, you know, you're delivering a message and, and whether it's a message of healing or, uh, you know, like we're all in this together kind of, cause that's, that's what this is. A lot of these songs are struggles and when people get inside your writing and get inside that struggle, they can either, you know, they can decide to commiserate with you, which is part of the blues, because let's just be honest, you know, some of the blues is, is getting it out of your system, like this is bad, and I wish it wasn't this way. But then, you know, at the end of it, it's kind of cathartic, because you get it out of your system. And then maybe at the end of it, there's some hope, you know, people say, okay, you know, that, that was therapeutic. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Bridget. You know, and um, that's all, that's all you can do. You know, you're on this earth for a short period of time and we all, you know, right now it's, it's rough. It's, it's really rough. You don't want to turn on the news. You don't want to, you don't, you know, music can yeah. be a therapeutic here. Um, and I, I thank you for your friendship. You're a, a good guy to come on. And again, my best to Bridget too. And uh, tell her I said, hello. We are honored uh, and thank, uh, thankful for our friends uh, and thankful for you. Grateful for all that you do for music as well, because uh, you're bringing music and exposing uh, you know artists who probably would get, wouldn't get that exposure to people. And we appreciate that. But that's not what it's all about. It's, it's about it. We are all in this together. And this too shall pass. Yes. <laughs> One way or another, sir. All right. Again, thanks to Tim Fick, my special guest today from the Bridget Kelly Band. Uh, again, I will try to close and do a plug. Dark Spaces is out there, but not only Dark Spaces, but Blues Warrior and um, Back in the Blues. And I'm just going to go through all of these. Why not? Forever in Blues. And then uh, the first album I ever bought, which is Bone Rattler, two discs, almost for the price of one. Depends, I guess, on where you buy it. But um, it's worth all of these just great guitar work, great vocals, honest music. And uh, thanks again, Tim, for being here. Thank you so much, David. And you have a wonderful 2021. All right, man. <laughs>